two, one. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael O'Reilly, and it's a pleasure being with you here today uh, for this VR uh, presentation around uh, virtual reality learning and how it's making workplaces safer. This webinar is sponsored by the Australian Institute of Health and Safety, whom I'm a member of and have been a member of for a number of years. Uh, so it's a, it's a real pleasure to be presenting this to you today. I believe we've got something like 400 odd uh, attendees registered for today. Pretty amazing turnout. Um, so hopefully I do uh, the presentation justice and, and um, make the most of your valuable time here today. Um, so a few formalities we'll take you through before we get stuck into the presentation. We will be recording it um, and it will be made available to you post the webinar uh, as well as the presentation. So both of those will be made available to you and uh, you can look through them freely at your leisure and so forth. And there will be some questions available to be asked at the end um, and throughout actually. So if you have any questions you'd like answered uh, as, a, as a process of going through this VR uh, webinar, uh, please feel free to put them into the chat section or the question section and Phoebe will graciously assist us at the end uh, about getting those questions to, you, to me and answered to you. Uh, so thank you very much, Phoebe, who's with the AIHS and uh, who's our moderator today. So welcome once again, thank you. I just wanna give you a little bit of a, um, a quick, whoop. What's going on there? Oh, there we go. <laughs> uh, technical difficulties already. So, um, just a quick one. This is this webinar we're doing today is part of a an offer to you all that is a free trial um, around virtual reality technology. So I'm calling it the Oprah Day. Uh, we're going to give out headsets. So you get a headset. You get a headset. You get a headset. So it's the Oprah moment. Um, we have dozens of headsets available to gift to you um, as AIHS members, exclusive. You will return them when you're done with them, of course, but um, they will be available to you. All you need to do is um, get your phone out, go to that QR code, click on it, uh, register your details. Should only take you a few moments. That QR code is on every single slide here in the um, presentation. So at any stage, you can click on that and register your interest. And uh, we will send you a VR headset, an Oculus Quest 2 VR headset. 30 days with five VR safety training experiences, work at heights, confined space entry, manual handling, chainsaw operation, hazard ID. Um, and we will support you through that journey too. We'll help you with remote learning, uh, remote Zendesk support and um, a survey program also, which will help you gather data and information from your own workplace as to what your people got out of the learning experiences, whether they actually helped them with the learning, whether they enjoyed it, so on and so forth. So that's available to you as a part of this uh, webinar today. So register interest as you're going through. That slide will also um, come up later on in the, um, in the presentation too. So just wanna give you a little bit of a rundown about who I am and what, um, why I'm, I'm presenting to you today. <clears throat> so I'm a lifetime HSE professional, like pretty much all you guys and gals listening in today. So I studied behavioral science back in um, 2000, uh, sorry, back, uh, back at university, at Griffith University. And the major I studied there was work and health. So basically I came out of university as a behavioral based safety professional. And I was very fortunate to um, um, spend some of my early career in uh, some very heavy industry sectors, particularly in the oil and gas space, lucky in some ways, um, unlucky in others. And I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. So um, I had a bit of a life changing moment in February 2003 while I was working for an oil and gas drilling company called Century Resources. And very unfortunately, um, there was a fatality in our business. And that fatality was a young gentleman, his name is Scott Karajic. There was a subsequent coronial inquest into his fatality. And one of the things which came out of that fatality was that uh, Scott uh, perhaps would have been, we would have avoided a fatality with Scott if indeed we had a better competency and qualification framework and had better training processes and programs in place. So that's really has informed my career as a HSE professional. Sadly, that event happened, but I've used uh, that experience to try to motivate a desire to make the industry better and safer here in Australia and abroad. And from that journey in 2006, I started my first business called Harness Group, which is a safety and training business, uh, which is still around today. It's a very successful business in three different countries. Uh, and through that journey, one thing I really come to realize was that even though we were training people, we weren't really getting great outcomes out of it from a learning knowledge acquisition and knowledge retention perspective. And as a safety professional, as many of you are, that's um, a really concern, a really big concern because 
we often send our people away for training, hoping that we can tick that box and say, this person is now more knowledgeable, they're going to be safer as a consequence. So knowing that was a real concern to me. And that's why we started looking for better ways to train people. Um, and that's where we started Next World, this virtual reality business a number of years ago. And now we're international with that business too. So I'm gonna talk about, uh, about that journey, but also, and how that journey is all about trying to help make workplaces safer and also talk with you about the science, the data, and where it's come to, which for me as a long, lifelong safety professional is extremely inspiring and gives me hope for the opportunity to make some big safety inroads into the future. So for many of you, you're here to understand a little bit more about what VR is, what virtual reality is. And to be brutally honest, the best way for you to understand how powerful VR could be or can be is to get a headset and put it on. It really is an epiphany moment. It really is a beautiful time to see what the power of VR is when you stick that headset on. So again, I do encourage you to grab, um, op the, grab this opportunity to get a VR headset through, the, through this program we're on offer. But essentially it is using computer technology to create a simulated environment. So it is the highest end form of simulation you can get. And that 3D environment is spatial, it is interactive which is from a learning perspective, as you can appreciate, extremely rewarding. You're gonna get amazing results from doing it that way, from doing learning that way. And it's obviously categorized by the head mounted displays or headsets. Um, and the, the preeminent uh, supply of headsets in the world at the moment is probably Oculus, which is actually owned by Facebook incidentally, which probably shows you where the technology is going, supported by the big enterprises of the world. Now, before I get into VR too much in earnest, let's go back to this old theory of the Swiss cheese model, right? Now, to really make inroads into safety uh, performance and to reduce incidents, and then at the end of the day, we've got to come back to the causal factors. What is causing incidents, right? Now, obviously it starts with hazards and it comes through with these opportunities to prevent loss. And as I've already mentioned with that fatality that was unfortunately a part of my early career and part of my early life, there was a big element there around knowledge acquisition, around competency qualifications. And we do know that there is always many opportunities to prevent these accidents from happening. And there are opportunities to prevent that loss. <clears throat> now, what we also know, and this is a Safe Work Australia statistic, that up to 60% of all workplace incidents have an element, of not, uh, an element associated with them in terms of a causal factor that relates to competency, learning, and training. So that keeping that in the back of your head, this is where VR and the power of it from a learning uh, performance perspective comes into uh, some reckoning. So you've got the hazards, we know this, everyone's familiar with this, this is not new knowledge, but there's, a there's one of the big causal factors is always something, something to do with the ability to identify those hazards. And that's a real individual basis thing that might have something to do with experience levels, might have something to do with training levels, age demographic, risk tolerance plays a role, training often plays a role. So do so many other factors, but this is where virtual reality comes into its own. I wanna give you an example around one of the most common cause, uh, common areas where workplace fatalities happen and that's in confined spaces. And this is based on OSHA data out of the US. So in 2018, a major study of confined space incidents um, happened and they found that 2.1 million people entered confined spaces under permit annually with 670 deaths in 2018 around entering into confined spaces. So that's a big number here in Australia, it's a lot less of course, proportionally so, but it allows you to sort of explore a real key area where we know that deaths happen quite a bit in the workplace and that's in confined space entry. And what they found in this big study was that 85% were unable to identify a hazard. So that's a big part of that overall uh, 670, isn't it? And what they also found was that 60% of all fatalities in this area were rescuers, so they were diving in to help. So there's a bit of an emotional sort of component to it, no doubt, or a behavioral instinct to try to assist people. But certainly it was that inability in many cases to identify hazards and then to react to those hazards. So knowing those things, right, I want you to think about what you're spending your money in in your businesses right at this moment in terms of um, proactive and preventative measures to try to reduce incidents. And what we know is that the average medium to large size business in Australia spends around 2% of salary on learning and development. So if you're a big construction company and you spend $100 million on, on uh, salaries, you normally spend around 2%, $2 million on, on training, learning and development. And that's the same across most 
areas. It's certainly a guiding principle that we find to be fairly true and fairly accurate. So the thing I want you to think about is, are we focusing enough on the hazards in, 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 in that instance? Are we spending enough on helping people identify the hazards? And what ROI are you getting from your current learning and development programs to help reduce the hazards and help get people's awareness and knowledge levels up to scratch? Now, this is where I start to turn to the VR side of things, right? Because I've painted the picture there around what's happening in the workplace, what's causing incidents, what sort of results we're getting, um, and some of the causal factors, right? So this is where VR is starting to really play an amazing role. And a lot of people aren't aware of this data. And this is the beauty of VR. It is releasing or unleashing the power of new data into what we as HSE professionals can now do. Now, these, these are proven facts, right, around, around VR technology. This is some stuff from PwC in terms of uh, VR. They've found that VR can be faster to train people by up to four times compared to classroom training. So from a, from a productivity perspective, when you're sending a people away from training, that's big numbers, right? That's huge numbers, getting massive productivity gains. There. And, and, and as you all know, getting 1% difference, 1% benefit in HSE performance, that's a big thing for us, isn't it? So getting four times better faster training is a big deal. What they're finding also is that uh, people are more confident to apply their skills learned from VR training up to 275% better. Now that's great. I'm sure that many of you have had incident uh, investigations in your career where you found that an act, uh, hesitance or reluctance or reticence, lack of confidence played a role. Um, so this helps big time when it comes to people um, getting better safety outcomes. What they've also found is that people are 3.75 times more emotionally connected to the content in the classroom than learners in traditional ways. E-learning, class-based training, so on and so forth nearly four times more emotionally connected, which shows they're more engaged, they're more immersed, and they're getting better outcomes as a consequence. And what we've also found through VR learning is that people are four times more focused than their e-learning peers. Now, think about e-learning, right? What do you do? You're sitting at a computer, someone walks by, they take your attention, your phone goes off. It's boring as the proverbial anyway. So you're not getting a lot of focus. You're not getting much attention when you're doing your e-learning, right? And it's well known to be very ineffective. So as a safety professional, again, you're looking at that and going, I'm kind of hinging my bets on e-learning, but it's ineffective. So I'm ticking a box saying someone's completed the training, but I'm not getting the outcome, right? So that's a big blind spot for someone as a HSE professional. That's where VR comes in. You cannot get distracted in VR. You're immersed and engaged in a full headset. You do not see the phone. You do not see people walking by. You are engaged and not distracted at all. And again, talking more about data. This is where the data of learning, knowledge acquisition, retention is really amazing. People are getting uh, massive improvements in their assessment scores when they're going through VR learning compared to traditional learning. So on average, people will get 73% through conventional methods, scores in their assessments. But when they do it in VR, they're getting 93%, 20 points better, right? That's a big number again. So we're not talking small numbers here, we're talking big numbers here. Increased productivity, 60% faster. We've talked a bit about that. We've also seen people retain knowledge a heck of a lot better. And that comes down to the pyramid of learning, the cognitive neuroscience of learning. Because VR is so immersive and engaging, you're getting far superior retention of knowledge because it's more sticky. Knowledge is more sticky through VR. So I want you to imagine with me for a second, right? The ability to take that information in a virtual learning environment and then to do something else with it. Now, this is where the real game is changed from a virtual reality perspective. So it's already great from a learning cognitive neuroscience perspective. VR learning is already fabulous from that perspective. We've already seen great numbers there, proven time after time by PwC, by Deloitte, by universities by Walmart in the US, by all these big organizations. VR is clearly superior from a learning perspective over traditional methods. So we're already seeing that, right? So that's one great thing. But this is the game changer, people. The game changer is when you're in a VR headset, you can track people's eyes. You can see what they're looking at. You can see what they're not looking at. You can see how long they're looking. You can see if they have situational awareness. These sorts of things you cannot get in traditional methods such as e-learning and, and class-based training. You can in VR. Through gaze control, eye tracking, there is a new value of data coming to the fore. And that is through studying the learners. So we can now study the learners. And here's an example for you. So here you have a bit of a snapshot, right? 
of a workplace. So this is just a construction example. It's two dimensional, it's really hard to show you the power of VR in two dimensional format. So please forgive me for that. But again, take you can get access to the VR headset and you'll see this all for yourself in real 3D format. So what happens is someone will stick on the headset and they'll go through a hazard ID learning experience, for example. And in that learning experience, there'll be an array of hazards scattered throughout. They might be a work at heights type hazard. They might be a dropped objects type hazard. They might be a simultaneous operations type hazard, overhead power lines, underground power lines, a variety of things, right? And what we can do is people will turn the headset and they'll be looking around and they'll be identifying the hazards in the workplace as well as learning on the fly. And we'll be able to see that Billy, for example, looked at this hazard for three seconds, then he looked away, then he looked back, looked at it for another two seconds, looked away, something else, selected a hazard over here, maybe a guy on a ladder. Over here, he saw a forklift, maybe gonna have contact with another person. And then he went back to that other hazard again and didn't select it again. So what that illuminates is that Billy can't spot that hazard for some reason, or in his mind, he has a low risk threshold and it's not worthy of hazard status. And when you're going through these learning experiences, this is how it starts to unfold. So you're looking at the work site. And remember again, this is, you know, we, the VR experience is a three dimensional, not two dimensional like this, but this manifests a little bit for your viewing uh, pleasure, so to speak. So here you have a number of potential hazards. And there's one at the top there that's not even marked as you can see. So there's people working in this environment and these are the hazards. And you can see where Billy, for example, our hypothetical worker, should be putting his eye gaze, but you can also see where he's focusing it the most, where the red, red heat map is the most visible. And what you can also see is where Billy says, okay, the guy on the EWP, that's not really a hazard, right? So this starts to paint a picture for you and is extremely valuable as a safety professional. Now, data is data, what you do with it is king. What you do with that data is absolutely critical, right? And this is where we take the power of that data in the headset and manifest it in the dashboards, in the dashboards rather. So, excuse me. And we do that on an individual basis. We do that on a trend basis. We do it on a group di a dynamics basis in the workplace. We can do it on a business basis. So what happens is you we take that data across what they see in the manual handling vir virtual reality learning experience, the work at heights virtual reality learning experience, hazard ID, et cetera, all of which are mapped to units of competency, by the way, in terms of the development structure and the design side. They don't equivalent, they're not equivalent to those learning experiences, uh, sorry, the units of competency entirely, but they make a fair progression there. And what you do, what we do with that data is we take it, we put it in these dashboards and you can see, for example, here on your right-hand side, all the team members and where their aggregate risk profile is around hazard awareness, risk awareness, situational awareness in the workplace. And that's a beautiful thing. We now can see where our risks are as a business and where we need to spend our efforts. That's not been available to us till now. That is a revelation. Furthermore, as you can see on the left here, this is the risk profiling and it's expressed in dials, right? So what you have is this situation where you can see the numbers here, you can see a one there, a two here, a three there, et cetera. They relate to each of the various learning experiences, which are also insights, aren't they? They're not just learning experiences, they are insight avenues for us as HSE professionals. So that we can see that this person here, Kylie, a fictitious person, um, what, what she got from a uh, learning experience number one in terms of her risk profile, um, aggregating the hazard awareness, the risk perception, the situational awareness, et cetera, and where, how she went against all these other ones to create an actual dial presence there. So you can see that she's a bit in the red, in the orange zone. So she's probably needs someone to have a bit of intervention to help her be more hazard aware, more risk aware, and align her to the business requirements around risk profiling. So that's the sort of dashboards we can now manifest from these learning experiences. So no longer is it the case of e-learning, or class-based learning where they go in, they do it, they get the assessments, they get above 50% or 70%, whatever your cutoff is, sign off, box ticked, done. A lot further along the pipeline than that now. We, that, we have all that learning, but they're better engaged. We now know that through VR. And then from that VR learning experience, we are now getting revelations of predictability and insights into how they are with hazards, how they are with risk profile. Are they situationally aware? and we can now take that to a whole new level. It's an amazing revelation. These are some of the businesses that we work with or have are enjoying our experiences, many of them here in Australia, in fact, just into the New Zealand market recently too. 
Now I want to bring you back to this free trial. So this is this is the free trial we have again. Uh, you can again click onto that QR code whenever you feel like it. Um, and um, yeah, we'll send you the headset and support you out through it. But I guess the other key thing, which I'll just finally mention, um, like I said at the, at the outset, the key thing here is making sure you get a headset on and you actually experience these things because that's where the revelation is. But one of the other things we're about to be able to do, cannot do yet, is take extraneous variables like age, experience, your WIC or your workers' compensation industry code and overlay that data with the hazard awareness, the risk profiling, the situational awareness type data. When we get to that point, we're, we're releasing a whole new area of data, which we can then mine and create some interventions around. So look, that's, that's the presentation from me, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I really appreciate your time. I'm very happy now to take any questions you may have. I believe there's about four or five there in the system. So I might hand over to Phoebe now, if that's okay, and we'll yeah. get um, we'll answer some questions. Easy. So Anita, um, she's just asking for the for the headset trial program. Is it possible to have these sent in January so we don't lose time in the thirty days during Christmas shutdown? Absolutely. No, absolutely. We're always uh, willing to help out with that, and it makes total sense, really. So happy to help out there with Anita. Um, so another question is, what do you think will follow virtual reality in the future? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I, I, you know, 10 years ago, I never really expected VR would be as powerful as it is now, particularly in the insights and the eye tracking side of things. Look, I, I think that the historical ways of learning will eventually die out and VR will, will ascend to the majority of the way we train and educate people. I know people in the university sector are very much um, of the belief that, their industry is going to be very significantly disrupted and the old bricks and mortar style universities will be very significantly disrupted in the next 20 years. Um, I feel the same way about workplace learning. I think that uh, there's going to be a, a whole array of, uh, and there already is, of VR learning experiences filling all parts of the training matrix in most businesses. I think if you look at even soft skills training, uh, if you look at uh, workplace harassment, empathy building, discrimination. There are already VR experiences available in those areas which have data associated with them, which can be used. And I think they're even affordable now too. That's the key thing, like um, convergence had to happen before VR was viable. And that's convergence in hardware and software and pricing. Now that's happened. That convergence has happened. And now it's all about take up and getting to that sort of adoption gap issue, which is happening. Absolutely a moment, Phoebe. Awesome. So just another question. So just wondering, um, this is from Barb. So just wondering if you are working to get your courses, for example, working at Heights, fully accredited to the equivalent national unit of competency um, yeah. with completion of a simple um, unit assessment. Yeah, so, uh, another good question. We are working very hard on that question. Barb, I think you said. Um, yeah, we're working with RTOs. We're in partnership with Construction Skills Queensland to do a major study with QUT um, to push out that kind of information also. We already map our training programs to uh, the relevant unit of competency. So Work at Heights is mapped to RII, WHS, something or other, um, to about 60, 70%. It certainly maps equivalent in the knowledge side. It, where it falls down is in the practical side, right? Because of the way that ASK was structured around that sort of part of the assessment. But I think ASK will eventually fall into line in a number of years time when they see the legitimacy and the proven track record of it. Interestingly, Australia is fairly unique with the likes of New Zealand around the unit of competency performance and assessment criteria side of things. Uh, whereas in the US, they don't have that kind of um, demand or requirement or definition around competency. So what we're finding is the move into the US is really quite easy for us. Uh, and it's happening very rapidly because of that. But um, yeah, ASQA needs to put a bit of effort into understanding how VR works and how it works from a powerful learning perspective. Uh, we're certainly engaging with them, um, but it's gonna take some time, Barb, I really believe. And, and a lot of pressure from industry, that's where CSQ comes in, that's where QUT comes in. Um, so I think in time that'll happen, Barb, uh, I firmly believe that. Awesome. So just another question from Anita. Um, how hard is it to create your own course content or do you sell the content with the headset? How easily can the content be customised? Yeah, that's perhaps one of the biggest problems with VR right now. It's still, you still need VR designers and engineers and so coders and so forth to build it. But what our philosophy is we just build what we know industry needs. So we just build work at heights, confined space, manual handling, all these VR learning experiences 
to be off the shelf. So you can just grab what you need, like going to the old Blockbuster. Um, so we build them again, relevant to the unit of competency, um, and then we make them available. So those are available at only $190 per month per learning experience, unlimited use. So um, it's very affordable. So we just know the industry needs it. So we just build it anyway. Uh, and then we make it available. Uh, if you want an induction type program made, we can build those also usually in 3D photogrammetry. So they're actually representative of your workplace. Um, and so, yeah, so it, if you want custom builds, they can be quite expensive still. So another question. So what kind of industries are the VR experiences set in? Is there scope to have industry specific training developed? There's certainly scope for it. Most of our experiences are built to be set kind of industry agnostic. Um, our, learning, our manual handling learning experience is built mostly in a warehouse environment. Um, a lot of our um, hazard ID work at heights uh, learning experiences are built mostly in construction environments, but they are fairly agnostic type hazards that we integrate within. Um, so manual handling in a warehouse, uh, the other experiences, many of them in a, a construction environment, some of the others in general industrial type environment, like confined spaces, sort of like in ge general construction environment. Excavator, that's in the sort of um, a big sort of uh, earthworks environment that could be anywhere, construction or other. Um, in with that experience, it's in, there's overhead power lines, below ground uh, infrastructure, you've got to navigate and dig through correctly. Um, it has elements of loading and unloading or load restraint type training also. Uh, so they're kind of, they're built to be fairly industry agnostic. What are the costs? Can small organisations afford to use this equipment? Yeah, that, that's the thing. Our philosophy has been build it in volume um, so that everyone can afford it. Uh, so as I mentioned there a moment ago, so we do a VR bundle uh, where you, experience, you get uh, five VR learning experiences and that only costs you $570 a month. That includes the headset. Headsets go for about 400 bucks. So we include that in the VR subscription and you get unlimited use. Unlimited use, so you can put 20 people through the VR learning experiences a day if you wish, if you want to. Normally the VR experiences go for about 30 minutes. Um, and uh, so that, you know, you can plow people through that, through these uh, learning experiences. Really great from a refresher perspective or a com, um, keeping people aware, knowledge retention perspective. Uh, for people in the business who you think it'd be really handy, they have some manual handling knowledge, but not necessarily send them away for training, really handy for those guys and gals also. Um, so very affordable, it's extremely affordable, cheaper than the current training models for most companies. And, um, and it's on demand on site. So you don't need to, need to send people away either. Awesome. So um, just from Todd, uh, what are your views on where this sits with face-to-face -face training and how to integrate with adult learning principles of 70, 2010? Yeah, I think um, what we're finding is that particularly here in Australia with the likes of ASCA, as Barb mentioned and probably was alluding to in her, in her question, is we're finding RTOs are actually starting to embed VR within their training framework. So they might do a safety training course such as work at heights and normally the morning will be theory and the afternoon will be practical. And normally you'll have a whole bunch of people standing around because the trainer can only spend so much time with one person um, and the others have to stand by watching. So what they'll do is they'll rotate the others through VR learning experiences around work at heights just to keep the learning experience rich and engaging, have them doing something meaningful. So we're finding that sort of thing's happening a lot. Um, and so I think that's going to continue to grow and evolve and to the point where people maybe even get them get their uh, students to do VR before they come to training in that blended type experience. Uh, so that's for the accredited side of things. And again, I think there'll be a real strong place for VR in the refresher and ongoing training um, and a partial VOC, even checking people's quality of knowledge and so forth. Um, just another question. So do you think the effectiveness of VR training might diminish over time as the novelty factor wears off as we see more of it mm. and um, as it moves uh, to the mainstream? Yeah, that's, I, I do not know the answer to that. It's a very good question mm. though. Uh, it may do. It may do. We certainly haven't seen that so far. I guess if you look at analogous um, areas such as VR for gaming, gaming uh, for people who use it for gaming, um, VR's really taken off there. There's been no real drop off. Um, all of our experiences, we actually build a VR gaming gamification component within it. 
and we use flow dynamics uh, with our VR design. So, you know, it keep, keeps people engaged the whole way. Uh, it's, it's certainly a risk and it may happen, but I think the other benefits, and I probably should have answered this a little bit better for your previous question too, is that there's so many other benefits, you know, in the knowledge acquisition, knowledge retention. I think those will still stay. They won't reduce. Um, you, the, the learning is still going to be stickier than traditional methods. And I think that's why it will continue to grow and evolve. And as every day passes, there's far more learning experiences and learning content available in VR. And that's the key thing, you know, as HSE professionals and L&D professionals, we want to have a library of content available to us, which is meaningful and relevant. And as every day passes, that global library of VR learning experiences grows and grows and grows and grows and grows, where you're going to have manual handling training for nurses uh, in the medical fraternity for warehouses you're going to have like you do with e-learning all those sorts of uh, e-learning for manual handling training you're going to have it in vr and in fact you're going to be able to pick and choose which ones you want because there's going to be such a, a massive array of it too so i think that's going to absolutely happen in time already is happening awesome so just a question from the chat so from tony how do the how do the headsets cope with people um for instance with short sight sightedness do they need to wear their glasses with the headsets or yep. how does that impact the um, vr experience yeah the, the vr headsets mostly the ones we use are oculus um they have spaces in them so you can actually grab the headset take out the phone insert a spacer and it sort of expands out the the headset a little bit which allows you to wear your glasses for most uh, people who have just a mild short-sightedness or far-sightedness just a simple adjustment of the headset will be enough but the vr headsets themselves allow for cater for people with um, eye issues uh, or vision issues i should say and they just put in the space and that allows them to wear their glasses. So that's an, an issue that Oculus and us have overcome quite easily. And um, there will be some people who unfortunately will struggle with that, but most mostly it's a solved problem. Awesome. So um, what role do you think that the learning data might have in legal proceedings following an incident? Wow, that is my favorite question. Who was that? <laughs> Ant Anthony Mitchell. Anthony, I love that question, mate. Um, probably have a have a beer over that one one day. The, the thing I find the most interesting around the legal side, and you might be looking at it from a different perspective, but I look at it from the industrial manslaughter side of things. So what we have now is, is CEOs sitting at the top who are responsible for a lot of things, you know, safety of their people. Um, and they, they believe that they're spending money 2% uh, on keeping their people safe in terms of training and L&D and so forth. But what they are starting to realize is they're not getting that knowledge acquisition. They're not getting that knowledge retention. Therefore, their people aren't guaranteed to be safe. The box is being ticked, but it's not being ticked in a way which says that my people are now safe. So what is happening is that they're realizing that's not happening, that, the, that their people aren't getting return investment for that dollar spend in, in safety training. But there is this other option available. So I'm waiting for the negligence case to come up where the, people, where the judge or the, the, the um, solicitors say, you had this other option, you chose this cheap Charlie option and this guy got injured as a consequence, maybe you're negligent because you chose the poor option, even though this one's four or five times better. So I'm waiting for that. Um, I think this, if, 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 you're, if you're coming from the perspective of um, uh, learning design and you know, you've got the unit of competency over here, which kind of makes people feel safe, compared to over here, VR design, um, that's up to the integrity of the designers, the VR designers and the VR houses that you, you buy the services from uh, to ensure and show to you that they use VR experience designers, that they do map at the units of competency, that they show you they have all the gaps assessed and that, that you actually quality check that process. So I think just like you do with all other uh, third-party providers of any, any kind of service offering, that's that part there. So hopefully I've answered that question there across both uh, concepts. Awesome. So just from David, um, he sees the benefits, but how are older workers adjusting to this technology? Yeah. So we, we've done some studies on this and those studies are ongoing. And what we come back to is a couple of things. One is digital proficiency and digital literacy. Uh, now, the state governments in Australia are very concerned about digital literacy for obvious reasons, you know, an ageing workforce, and we want to make sure people have a future. Uh, so they're investing heavily into it. Um, so are we. What we found is that your older blue collar guys really work fairly well early on with the VR headsets. They might be sort of 65% digitally literate, digitally proficient. 
even within the first experience, they're gaining literacy and proficiency, right? By the time they get to their fourth exposure, they're up to 95% digitally literate, literate proficient. So that's pretty good. Uh, if you remember back 10 years ago, they said the iPad wouldn't work. Look at it now. Most older guys, even my mum's who's 70, she uses the iPad like it's going out of fashion. Um, so certainly those um, technology gaps get bridged. The headsets we use, we use specifically because they're easier to use for blue collar guys and girls. People maybe have a little bit lack experience in uh, digital technology such as VR. So it is something that needs to be mindful of and it's good for you to say that, David, but it can be overcome. And uh, what we find is that the gap early on gets overcome by the rewards later on. Awesome. So just uh, what software and skills do you need to tailor the risk experience to your own workplace? Uh, you can't right now. You do rely on third parties right now. In time, I believe there'll be the ability to build those sorts of experiences, just like you build PowerPoints, but that's, that's some years off right now. You do have to rely on third parties right at the moment. Um, so uh, yeah, unfortunately, no, uh, no ability to do that right now. Um, just another um, question. So we've had a, a lot of questions come through, which yeah, is great. I see that. Um, yeah, fabulous. Um, so another one. So what will we experience with the headset you send us as a trial? Yep. So you'll receive the headset complete with at least five experiences. We'll probably throw a couple of other ones in there just for you to taste test, so to speak. Um, so there'll be the full learning experiences. Uh, theoretical component in the headset, then uh, before that even, you'll get sort of taught in the headset how to use it, you know, how to use the buttons, how to, how to stand and how to move and how to act, interact, how to teleport, which is a pretty cool experience, go from location to location in a virtual world. Then you'll move into the theoretical component, which will have some assessments, um, some gamification elements. Then you'll move into the practical component where you've got to select hazards, answer questions in the, in the practical world, um, do risk assessments, do control measures, and a whole bunch of other actual activities where you're engaged and immersed, maybe putting on a lockout tag out, maybe um, putting some boxes onto something, that sort of exposure, engagement. Um, so you'll have the full experiences across all of those, and then you'll be able to use them. Uh, you'll be provided with digital surveys so that you can actually go through that with yourself and all of your other people who go through these experiences, and you'll be able to aggregate that data and decide if it's um, something that you think is worthwhile for your business. Awesome. So um, just another question. Are you, um, is the learning modules uh, custom, customizable? If so, to what, to what extent? Yeah, they are to a reasonable extent. Obviously, we don't want to, we're really mindful about making VR accessible. And the accessibility is more important to us because of the power of it than customization. However, we do have a localization uh, program where we can include things such as logos, business colors, any specific requirements to a limited array, we can include those in. Uh, and there is a cost associated with that upfront ca uh, um, catering to tailoring, um, but you, it can be done, absolutely. That's one beauty about it. I'm very mindful, um, Phoebe, there's like still 30 questions or something there. Um, we might not get to them all. So just yeah, for those who um, have asked a question, your, your question is important to us, so we'll list those. And um, if your email address or there is a, um, a name reference, we'll definitely come back yeah, to you with, with a response sure. because your question is important to us. Um, so let me see, sorry. Um, does the VR learning um, completion count towards the statutory high risk work licensing requirements of no. the state regulator? No, so no, no it doesn't. Um, if you do, for example, work at Heights VR, uh, at an RTO, they may include it in there if they've mapped it correctly. So it's possible, um, but most have not done that right now. They're still in the in the sort of mode of integrating it and getting people used to it and um, if, in that part of the evolution process. Um, so um, how much knowledge do we need to train our students to use this technology? Do we have a walkthrough? Yeah, so that's where we play a role. We really help you there. Um, so we'll be involved in kickoffs and, and nurturing and supporting you through the program. Uh, we'll help with you to find a local champion or a local advocate who will be the sort of font of knowledge or the super user. Um, might be a training coordinator, a training administrator or a HSE officer, someone like that. Uh, so we'll work with you and them to make sure that they're fully equipped. We'll show them how to screen share, how to cast, how to use the headsets, how to troubleshoot. 
one of the beauties about this technology is that with the person or, or three or four people in the classroom who are on the headsets, you can cast that to a screen. So the other four or five people in the classroom can actually see what they're all looking at and use that as a, as a discussion piece. Oh, look at that, they missed that, or look at this part here and discuss that, identify the hazards and, and the processes and so forth too. So um, we help with that entire process though. So um, has the aged care industry been interested, interested in the VR training? Yeah, we haven't focused in that area too much, um, but there is a little bit of movement in that area. I know that there is some really great stuff and cool stuff happening in the aged care industry around um, sort of a dealing with depression and loneliness and so forth. So there's VR experiences out there which take people on virtual holidays and they're seeing some great um, inroads there in terms of um, mood and and uh, dealing with depression and, and uh, contentment. So that's some good stuff. We, we haven't been in that space. Um, just another question. So do you already, um, have you already started VR in other Asian countries like India or Bangladesh? No, no, we've, we're very, uh, we're here in Australia, absolutely strong as, but uh, in New Zealand now, we've just entered the New Zealand market and we're in the US market also. But um, certainly, We'll, we'll get to Asia uh, when the opportunity arises, but um, certainly locally here in Australia, New Zealand and the US have been our focus up to now. Sorry. Um, so with COVID, how hygienic is it to reuse the he headsets and swap between people? Yeah, so we supply um, headset cleaning equipment and headset cleaning equipment such as wipes and so forth is available freely also. Excuse me. So that does the job very, very well. And so we've got instructions and guidelines around how to actually maintain the headsets. There's also, in addition to that type of um, capability to clean the headsets, which gives a 100% um, uh, benefit, there is actual, um, what are they called now? Like ultraviolet boxes you can stick the headsets into, which totally, uh, there are a couple hundred bucks at each, I think. Um, so that you can stick the headsets in those and it's, it beautifully cleans them too. So there's, there's technology out there. Um, the ultraviolet is good too because it doesn't interfere with the lenses. Um, are there any issues introducing the software into the business into the business IT systems, for example, government departments? Um, not really, not that we've seen. Uh, there is obviously usually a process you have to go through, but there really hasn't been a problem with that. Um, you know, it's, it's like in introducing any kinds of software to the business. Um, every business has their own firewalls and needs and IT support requirements and so forth. I think the key thing from our perspective is we always work really hard to support uh, our Zendesk program and our um, nurturing program to help organisations be successful when they're bringing VR tech in is, is pretty, pretty rewarding and successful. Um, so yeah, we work with the IT departments all the time. You, sometimes there may be a need to build APIs between certain software so they're communicating between. That's fine too. That's the sort of thing we provide service along. I'm just keep um, just being mindful of the time. That's all. But uh, we've got a we can fit a few questions in. So, yeah. what does ASQA, Australian Skills um, Quality Authority, feel about training um, via VR? Yeah, um, they're, they're reticent a little bit um, in terms of they haven't approved VR, so to speak. You know, they've certainly been more flexible of late thanks to COVID around VR technology. They just, their key concern is making sure the mapping is happening that the performance and evaluation criteria is being met. And if you can prove that, then they're okay with it. So they're not ruled out VR. They just want to make sure that any business that's adopting it in, in their uh, enterprise have just mapped it correctly and it meets the performance and evaluation criteria. So we do that already. We map that and then we provide that in with all of our learning experiences. But also the RTOs that use it, they have to do that. And you as a business needs to do that too. Um, so that's, that. yeah, ASQA is, ASQA is fine with it. And, um, and uh, no, they're not against it at all. All righty, I think this is gonna be our last question. Um, is there any other thought to create experiences in agriculture, forestry and fishing, given that there's Absolutely. such a high um, mm. the fata fi uh, fatality and serious injury rates? Absolutely, uh, we have a chainsaw experience, which is extremely good. Um, and that the, the Department of Environmental Services here in Queensland have been trialling it recently. They're going to extend it to their fire department, I believe, which is over 150 people. Uh, and the chainsaw is a great one because it very much relates to the forestry area. Local governments love it also because they, particularly in remote areas, they, um, uh, they, ha they have to do a lot more in those sorts of regional remote areas for local governments. So they love that part. 
Uh, so they have their people do the VR learning experience for Chainsaw there. Um, so we have some, and we're constantly building out these VR experiences. Right now we're building a traffic control VR experience and then a fire extinguisher VR experience, a fire warden VR experience. We've got 20 in the pipeline for development. Um, so we're constantly building and, and uh, bringing to our, our clients in the market VR learning experiences. We won't stop until we've built out everything. Awesome. Um, I think that's all we have time for today. Mm -hmm. um, it is 12.45, but yeah, if anyone did have any other questions, um, they're all, I'll get them, I'll forward them on to Michael and um, we'll get those answered um, for everyone, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, Phoebe, if I can get those, I'll uh, make sure we get back to them by next week sometime uh, with yeah, their sure. questions. I thank them very much. I think we've got like 40 left that we haven't got to, which is yeah, really cool. fabulous. <laughs> um, and I see a lot of requests coming through for the headsets too, a lot. So uh, we'll get back to all those um, requests also next week. Just um, a lot of questions there were around the experiences, which is fabulous. But the thing I really want to um, sort of commend you all to look at too is is the data side of things, the predictive analytics and the insights. That for me um, is where the holy grail is that um, we'll be able to see where our risks are more so than ever before. So I really look forward to showing um, people who go through the VR experiences in the headsets we send them and taking them on the journey to see that and how they can utilize that um, part of the technology too. Awesome. Thanks guys. And thank you, thank you Michael. Really um, appreciate your time. Yeah, too easy. And if, it, if anyone did have any other additional questions that they didn't put in that Q&A or the chat box, you can just email um, events at aihs.org.au and I can pass them on to Michael. Thank you, AIHS, and have a Thank great you. weekend and Christmas. Awesome. Everyone. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.